You're listening to Bad Dog Agility, bringing you training tips, interviews, and news about the great sport of dog agility. I'm Jennifer. I'm Esteban. And I'm Sarah. And this is episode 265. Today's podcast is brought to you by hitaboard.com. Hitaboard.com has the innovative training tools you need for agility. Having problems with the dog walker A-frame? The Hit It Board can fix that. Your dog doesn't like tugging? They'll love the tug it. Can't move your A-frame around by yourself? The move it can. Go to hitaboard.com and use discount code BDA10 to get 10% off your order. That's hitaboard.com. Today, we're going to give you a fall update on agility trials and COVID. And one of the reasons that we wanted to take this opportunity to do this is that Westminster just announced a change in date and venue uh, for the Masters Agility Championship at Westminster. And um, so we wanted to talk about that and also about some of the other big events and the changes that are happening and just kind of an update of where we are now you know, in this pandemic. Right. Let's go all the way back to March 6th. And that's the day that we came out with a podcast. And on that very day here in the United States, we had 319 confirmed cases of COVID and there had been 15 deaths. And let's fast forward to today. We have 8.5 million cases. This is just since March and we are here in October. It has not even been one full year. So we've gone from 319 to 8.5 million 226,184 dead in the U.S. alone. Uh, Our response here as a nation has not been good. Uh, I think when we look at a couple of uh, comparisons for our agility audience, we have a lot of listeners, for example, in Canada, Canada with a population of 37 million, which is about uh, uh, the U.S. is nine times more than Canada, right? Uh, Canada has about uh, 9,823 deaths. So all you would do is times that number by nine and you would get like 81,000. So you can see that's 30% of what we're getting here in the U.S. as far as deaths. So Canada is doing or has done a better job with the virus than we have. UK is the other one, the United Kingdom with a population of 68 million. So the U.S. is about five times that, but they have uh, 44,000 deaths. And you can see that their response is actually on par with ours. Right. And so both countries have done a really poor job. And, and these are three very big countries here uh, in agility, right, makes up the, the largest portion of agility in the world. And so uh, I wanted to put those numbers out there for you. Uh, by comparison, countries that did a very good job, uh, South Korea is our case in point, and they have 25,424 cases and just 450 deaths. Let that soak in. Today, we had more cases than Korea has had the entire time. Okay, today and one day. And uh, 450 deaths, they have a population of 51 million people. So our population is about six or seven times bigger. So even if you multiply that out, that's still less than 3,000 deaths, right? Which is a remarkable thing. And they were one of the early countries to be uh, hit by the virus. And they stomped it down uh, very quickly. I bring up South Korea because one of the things we will share with you in the show notes page is our very own uh, Jennifer Crank was uh, on a new South Korean variety show, game show, that, variety game show. Yeah, kind of like a, um, a reality TV show kind of. It's where a they series. Take, yeah. Right. It's, like, it's like Netflix, you know, like uh, what, whatever, you, whatever show you watch on Netflix, 10 episodes in a season. And what they are doing in South Korea is take, they're taking super famous people in, in South Korea. They call them idols. Right. They're usually singers, actors, entertainers. Um, they're, they're like the Disney kids here in the US. They sing, they dance, they act, they do lots of different things. Right. And so they used to have them do all these sports competitions against each other, you like know, like softball. Yeah. See the idol do things outside of their expertise. You know, they train with experts and then they go and compete against each other. Um, but COVID, of course, has changed all that. Right. And so for a country that has less than 500 deaths, right? You know, they've taken it very seriously and activities that are very high risk, they aren't doing it. And that includes a lot of different sports activities. And so uh, they're looking for these substitute activities and what do they come up with? Dog agility. Dog agility, right? <laughs> so in my head, I imagine that they're, you know, cl- the producers clicking around on the internet sees this video of Jennifer running Swift, right? And that's the one they were like, oh, we need this video. Can we put this video in our show, right? Jennifer and Swift. And so uh, they they contacted us to get permission to do that. And so, of course, you you can see Jennifer and Swift 
on the show. So we'll give you a link on how to get to the show. It's a whole series. They've just aired episode one. Sarah and I watch it in its entirety. It's great, great cliffhanger ending. And they literally are taking famous people. With their dogs. With their own pet dogs. Their own pet dogs. And they're working with like a a, a professional agility trainer. They have an FCI judge. They have a two the two people on the panel of four. It's like a you know your commentator, then your famous actress or actor person, and then an FCI judge, and then also a regular dog trainer, like a, 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 I assume an agility trainer as well. And um, uh, they so they teach them up, and then they then they put them out there. And so far in in week one, like I don't want to give it away, but they have a, a, a cool basically it's, it's very basic like a straight line sequence. Yeah. But I've seen some of the previews, right? And they have like full courses with obstacles and all that stuff. And um, it's it's really great. You should watch it. You can get it on Viki. Yes. V-I-K-I. We'll, we'll put a link in the show notes and we'll put a link to um, a short clip that little, shows- little clip. Uh, You'll see some of Jennifer, Jennifer in there. Right. It shows Jennifer right. on it and see the and Bad Dog cool. Agility right. logo they, right. and they show Bad Dog Agility and all that stuff. Yeah. And yeah. don't be confused. I did not actually travel there oh, to yes, be yes, on no, the right. show. <laughs> right. They just it is a video. It. And, it, and, it, and they used it exactly the way I expected. They just asked for permission to, to use it in a series that they were putting together that featured dog agility. And uh, when I looked at the, what they were doing with these you know, taking these idols and letting them do agility with their pet dogs. I thought, oh, they're just going to show Jennifer to show what agility looks like with somebody who knows what they're doing. <laughs> and that's exactly how they used it. It was like, as they were describing what agility is, mm-hmm. you see Jennifer running swift uh, in the background. And uh, and then they, they cut to the uh, idols training their dogs. Yeah, well, it's so worthy of mention because that is a country that is single-minded in their focus to defeat the coronavirus, right? And they are not going to run around doing things that are going to put people at risk. And so it is very interesting that they selected dog agility as something safe that they can do and put out there publicly. Yeah. Right. And one of the very cool scenes that you're going to see in this video is them disinfecting the field and equipment and gear. Yeah. Right. They've got people like in hazmat suits, like just spraying the stuff down with heavy duty chemicals. They were very, very serious when this thing came out. Like they were like wiping down the streets and, and sidewalks in uh, Seoul, uh, the capital of South Korea. So anyway, I wanted to bring up the South Korea situation. Uh, one other one, big uh, powerhouse country in uh, dog agility is Sweden. There's a lot of talk of Sweden because they kind of went for the uh, herd, herd immunity effect. Um, they took a very different approach from the rest of Europe. Uh, and they were like, you know, let's kind of wait and see how this is going to shake up. Maybe in the long run, it'll have been better. Uh, I think it's pretty safe to say that uh, it's been a failure, right? Uh, 10 million people in that country, uh, 107,000 cases plus with almost 6,000 deaths to date in Sweden. They're doing far worse than any of the other Scandinavian countries. Um, it's been a real uh, debacle over there, a political hot potato now, as it has become here in the uh, United States. Um, so let's kind of now, now that now that we have that big overview right we we sounded the alarm when it was nothing right it was just starting out and then we were like hey this is going to become something the science says so right and it turned out that that was the case uh, on uh, you know to the most extreme unfortunate level right and here we are now and well why why are, why are why are we here now why are we talking about this again well it definitely is relating to agility because we have had some resumption of trials both here in, in the United States as well as in Europe right um, and we're, we're kind of at this, uh, new tipping point, new inflection point. And unfortunately cases are starting to skyrocket again. Okay. And this was predictable. We knew that there would likely be a fall surge coming based on what we know of the behavior of other coronaviruses. Remember, this is not the first coronavirus to ever enter into the human population. And you can make some predictions based on the behavior of people. Uh, the two biggest ones being pandemic fatigue. Everyone gets kind of tired of it and they're like, hey, I'm tired of being cooped up in my house. We need to get out there and do stuff. Uh, we need to return to work. Um, uh, you know, economies everywhere are tanking. People need money. And um, the other one being that school's open, right? So one of the first things that happened in March was we had shutdown, right? Jennifer's kid came home. Our kids came home. Suddenly everybody was home and mobility really dropped down. Uh, people weren't going around as much, but all that obviously changes when school returns, right? So everybody's mobility is going to be going up. And so a lot of these things were predictable. Okay. Well, when we, um, 
look at cases and deaths. I think this is the the last point I'll I'll make about cases and deaths here. March and May, we were looking at here in the United States, about 33,000 new cases a day. Obviously a lot. Um, The peak was actually in the summer, July, 75,000, right? And then we were reaching that peak state where 2,000 people, Americans, were dying every single day. A new set of 2,000 Americans every single day, right? Um, Now we're at 60, 70,000 new cases. So we are almost back to July levels. And we are just at the start of this peak. This peak is going to be bigger, but the deaths are trailing, meaning we are not seeing 2,000 people die a day, right? So what's going on? If we're having the same number of cases, why aren't the deaths the same? So we're doing a much better job in a bunch of different areas. One is uh, uh, detection, right? So in general, more people are getting tested. In my opinion, is it enough? No, right? We should be testing even more than we're doing, right? The countries that have had more success have had more testing. Uh, number two, the people who do get sick are getting better treatment, right? Because we have much more information. Uh, doctors, science has really been on top of this, not just in trying to develop these vaccines of which there are more than 20 or 30 in progress, 20 or 30 different ones, but in how we treat people who are sick, how we treat people who are critically ill, um, experimental treatments, we're, we're doing, we're, you know, we're throwing the kitchen sink at this thing and we're doing it in a very fast uh, way. Okay, so uh, we see improvements in basically the death rate. So your risk of dying is much lower than it was before. Okay, um, but the rise in cases is very, very concerning. And I think here we want to get into, I think, let's, let's do this. Let us start talking about the events uh, one by one. And then what I'll do is I'll bring in the agility tie-ins as they relate to, to the virus and things that you should be thinking about if you're planning on attending these events, similar events, or even local trials. Just the decision to go to a local trial can be similar to, you know, the decision you would have to make in attending these events or not for you and, and yourself. All right. So first, let's start with the U.S. Open. So who has information about the U.S. Open? That would be Jennifer. <laughs> So the U.S. Open uh, is kind of UKI's national, right? So it was scheduled to be the second weekend of November in Florida. And they made a decision quite a while ago, kind of, uh, I think, you know, sometime in the middle of the summer to go ahead and cancel that event. Um, just given all of the, you know, issues with the coronavirus and the restrictions and the nature of the event, it just didn't make sense. Uh, it didn't seem safe. Also, keep in mind that UKI has a lot of their crew coming in from overseas, mm-hmm. right? So it's not an it's not a UK. localized event, right? Exactly. Yeah. So they went ahead and decided to cancel the U.S. Open. Um, what they are offering is the U.S. Open by video. So they are going to be offering an event on that same weekend where you will be able to sign up and then it will be video submission. So they'll have certain classes on certain days. You'll get the course maps in the beginning uh, or at the morning and you'll have that day to run it uh, and submit your video by midnight. And they're actually doing progressions and everything. So they'll have judges like judging live, letting you know if you make it into the next round. Um, so it's actually really nice in that regard. Um, the one thing that is also worth noting about the U.S. Open is that is the tryouts for WAO. Mm-hmm. So that is like the team trials for WAO. But that was also canceled. It was supposed to be held this past May. And what they decided is to uh, go ahead and roll the team over. So even though there's no U.S. Open, there really is essentially no need for a WAO tryout event because they are going to be rolling over the uh, past team. So, so yeah, I am actually planning to do the U.S. Open by video. Um, they are saying that if you are going to do it in a uh, facility other than your own, like you're going to do it in a club facility, you do have to seek approval. So you can't just, you know, open up your club and have 20 people coming in unless you get approval. And they have some questions for you on that regard. And even groups of four or more need to be notified to them. So I think they're really doing a great job, even virtually, of trying to make people uh, be conscious, be safe. Um, So groups of four or more, even if you're just in your backyard, need to be notified to UKI and any facilities that are going to open it up and allow it to be offered, they, they actually will need approval by UKI. So even virtually, they're trying to, you know, be proactive and do what they can, which I think is great. Yeah, we have a, a podcast with um, Greg when they first opened up um, Agility by Video where you could earn titles in, in UKI. And this was, um, I don't know, like in April or May or something like that. I'll put a link to that in the show notes. But I feel like they have really led the charge on the virtual aspect of, of dog agility competition. 
Um, USDA also came behind and started adding um, uh, virtual competitions that you could do for titling as well. Um, and, and I think that that's a really, really great option for a lot of people. I think it's really cool what they've done. Um, and people have been really excited to run these uh, open events because um, they've got some big name judges doing the designing of the courses, um, a lot of interesting courses, a little bit smaller spaces, so it's more accessible to more people. And um, as, as Jennifer noted, it is, it is basically a standalone event this year, as opposed to it being the gateway to WAO. So it's, it's just the one event itself, which I think mm -hmm. gives them some flexibility because if it's, if it had the team associated with it, I don't know that they could do some of the things that they're doing. For instance, um, your rank against other people is based on your own wheeling of your course and your yards per second based on exactly how you set it up. And of course, that can't be exactly the same from person to person. And, you know, we know that slight changes in angles can affect how something runs. And sure. so I think that um, having it be its own standalone event where everybody kind of understands the fudge factor, the wiggle room of, of how it's going to be run, and everybody agrees to that is a really great compromise. Um, so I think that's really cool. And they, the, um, the Canadian open has already happened, I believe, a couple of weeks ago, maybe. Um, and a lot of people did that and had uh, really enjoyed that and mm -hmm. the courses that they put together. Yeah, I think that's great. I, I think they're doing it the right way. I really like that great idea. Uh, so U.S. Open by video for people who are interested in that. We'll put a link to the in the show notes page. Yeah, it's uh, also still open. So those of you that are listening to it real recent from this podcast being um, posted, it is still open. So, you know, do, maybe they, have, do they have day of entries? Like No, no not for this not. one. Yeah, not for this one. Uh, UKI Lives does. But for this one, um, you do have to sign up in advance. But the registration right. is still open. So if anybody's thinking about it, give it a go. Okay. All right. Next one I want to talk about is the European Open. So normally that's an event held in the summer. Obviously this past summer was canceled and obviously next summer we can't know that they're going to have it. A lot of people are assuming, hey, we're going to get a vaccine. It's going to be great. It's not that simple. So I'm going to give you a, the very quick medical side and the medical side is it's not that simple, right? So first we need a vaccine. We need to make sure it's safe. And then we need to make sure that everybody gets it. Well, guess what? Already, at least here in the United States, there are a lot of people who are saying, we don't want to take the vaccine or we don't want to take the first version of the vaccine. Let's let other people take it, right? I'm a little bit in that camp. I don't know that I want to be taking the very first vaccine that comes out. Um, there's issues of production, distribution, all of those things, right? And so we're looking at March, April at the earliest, right? Widespread, getting it out there. How are you going to run this event as early as July? I think there's a very strong possibility, especially if over this next winter, this fall winter, a million people die in Europe. Think about it. A million people die in Europe. Are you really holding the, the US, or not the US, the European Open in, in July? I, I think it's very realistic that it'll be canceled. However, okay, let's all be very optimistic, right? Vaccines come out. They come out a little bit earlier, maybe January, February. They're highly effective. They're really good. Lots of people take it. Um, Europe, they really tamp down on it. You know, they have a very successful winter and so, and spring is going great. And so they say, you know what, we're going to hold the event during the summer. Okay. And Hey, we might even let some Americans come if they can get their act together on the other side of, of the uh, ocean. So from our perspective, they're like, okay, well, maybe we should have a tryout. Okay. So that's a long intro to say we're having a tryout. So Jen, tell us what you know about the uh, European open tryout for Americans. So the European Open is typically held in November. I'm sorry, the European Open tryouts is typically held in November. And uh, the European Open for this year was canceled back in May. Um, a lot of the people that were on the team or people who go to tryouts sat around going, are they going to hold an event in November? Are they going to have tryouts in November? And it was mm -hmm. recently announced that they are not. Um, one of the reasons that they hold it in November for an event that's not till July, because that's a really long gap, is yeah. that traveling to Europe in the summer can be very expensive and very difficult. And they want to give the team members a long time to plan their travel. So they went ahead and canceled November and they pushed it back to April. Mm. 
So they pushed it quite a bit. And it wasn't like mm-hmm. they pushed it six weeks. So the uh, EO tryouts is actually going to be in April. And the the plus side is is exactly that. It gives us this time to see how things progress, to see how the winner goes. I also think it gives um, AKC time to see if the event is actually going to be held in Europe. Because right. there's no reason for us to have a tryout right. if the event isn't going to be held. Um, the downside is if things do go smoothly, you are talking a pretty quick turnover for a team that is – you know, to try it out in April, maybe the team's not adva- uh, announced until May, and then we have to turn around and try to get over there in July. Um, but I definitely think it was the right decision, um, you know, to push it back a little bit. So the EO tryouts is actually pushed back to April as of now. Right, right. And we just can't know what the FCI is going to do about that competition. If they're going to decrease team sizes, that could be something that they consider. Normally, the EO is very, very big. Agility World Championship, three heights, four dogs each, team of 12, right? Plus, um, I think you could even see them eliminate relay and team because there's a baton exchange and there's, well, I guess there's not a baton, but there's an exchange. So maybe they'll do a smaller based event, individual only, right? you know, as opposed to no team. So I think there's, yeah, like you said, there's a lot of factors we got to write on the FCI. And that's why I I think it makes sense for AKC to push the event back to April. So we have more information by the time of tryouts. Yeah, I definitely applaud this uh, uh, decision. And April might even be late enough where end of March or early April, FCI sits down and says, you know what, we're looking at the numbers and we're going to go ahead and cancel this. You know, it, it requires a lot of planning and they already know at that point it's not going to happen. Then we don't even have to bother with tryouts, obviously, here, you know, as, as you pointed out. So I do like that as far as uh, strategic planning and it really helps with the competitors. Okay, uh, next thing we want to talk about um Oh, and, and European Open, I'll say, is outdoors. So, Jilly World Championship, indoors. European uh, Open is outdoors. So, we'll talk a little bit about indoors versus outdoors. That's something that we've learned over the past several months dealing with COVID. Well, I'll just say right now, it's better to be outdoors, right? Get outdoors, people. So, if you have an agility class and it's at a small indoor facility with a low ceiling, right? You have basically the air recirculating in there. And if anyone happens to be sick, but they don't know it, right? They're just going to be pumping out the viral particles right there uh, and uh, the, the virus. And um, out in the open, th- that largely gets carried away. And so this has been uh, uh, validated quite strongly in many, many studies over these past several months. And so almost all of the outbreaks are uh, based on indoor facilities, right? Um, assuming you have proper distancing, uh, and all that stuff. Obviously, if you're going to be in very close cramped quarters, say at the uh, nomination of Supreme Court justice without masks <laughs> in seats cramped next to each other, that doesn't apply even though it's outdoors. Right? right. And so agility, I think, naturally lends itself to having space. Obviously, there are choke points where people are going to be close together when you're about to go into the ring, things like that. But you can space those things out and really dramatically decrease the risk. So outdoors versus indoors, always consider that when you're thinking about what local trials you would like to attend outdoors is going to be better. Okay. Uh, next one I said, uh, let's do, uh, well, let's finish with Westminster. So let's talk about the AKC Invitational. Okay. Next. And, and actually I'm going to take a break here to say something that we probably should have said at the very beginning of the podcast now that I think about it, but, um, there may be listeners who do not realize that you are a medical doctor. So oh, just okay, sure, yeah. You know, f- the reason why uh, um, we uh, Jennifer and I let Esteban take the reins on all things medical is because he is actually uh, a physician. Um, and then for those of you who do know that he's a physician, it's also important to know that he is not uh, giving you medical advice, merely giving you a lay of the land as far as how things are going COVID wise. He is not your doctor, and he hasn't seen you, so he's not treating you specifically. That's right. That's that, right. All right. So now that we got that out of the yeah, way, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. the AKC Invitational, um, this is, I, I guess I would consider this the first major event happening um, in the COVID era. The, mm-hmm. the first major event that did not get canceled. The first major event that, as far as we know, is going forward. And this event happens every year in December. Um, the timeline for this event did not change this year. Um, it is happening in Florida. It is indoors. It is in conjunction with a very large confirmation show. And I believe also obedience. Yeah, Jennifer's nodding her head. So, um, but... 
what is different about this trial is that um, they are putting many, many restrictions in place, um, kind of in line with how we're seeing local trials run, meaning limiting the number of people inside, uh, requiring that masks m- must be worn at all times, including running in the ring. So no, no exemption for the actual person running. There will be no spectators. There will be no seating ringside there. Uh, you're expected to come run and, you know, go away. Temperature checks. Temperature checks at the door. So they are, are attempting to run, um, a big event in as safe a way as possible. And so I kind of think back to, um, but the timing isn't great, right? Because now we're, we're hitting this big spike in cases here. No, no, the there's fall. a couple of strikes against this event. And I think here, I want to make um, uh, very, very clear that, you know, we're covering all this because it's, it's dog agility, right? It's what we do. We cover all things dog agility. Um, I don't think the event should be run. Okay. That's from a, a, my physician standpoint. Uh, I, um, Oh, I, I trained in family. My residency was in family and community medicine at Baylor College of Medicine here in, in Houston, Texas. And then I worked in wound care for a long time, uh, nursing homes and, and, and whatnot. Um, so g- getting back to, uh, the, uh, the event, you know, there, there's a couple strikes against it. Uh, obviously one indoor facility, uh, although it's quite large. Yeah, right? it's like so a huge convention I said like center. Low, yeah. low ceiling, right? right? I made the distinction between low and high ceiling. So air circulation matters. It matters a lot, right? And, and we don't have um, uh, great data or, or large data points on like convention centers and hotels and, and the kind of venue that this is going to be in, right? Um, we can point to one spot that we know, Crufts, right? Yeah. So Crufts happened at a convention center, very similar to Florida in March, the very week that we put out that podcast, I think, right? Right. And um, there were probably likely cases related to that event, but they had no no contact tracing. The UK did a very, very poor job. Uh, and so we don't have the information that we would want from that event. I assume that there were cases that you can trace back to that event. Um, but that event was packing in tens of thousands of people exactly. That's- in a very small case, no mass, no social distancing. And here we have no spectators, 100% mask wearing, as you mentioned in the ring, which in my opinion, I'm gonna say this right now, should be the gold standard for all agility trials, okay? And I make no apology for people who, for whatever reason, medical or otherwise, cannot wear a mask while they run, right? Then in, in, in my view, if I'm certainly running the trial and I feel like, you know, you want to have dog agility trials, that, that's a, that's a rule. You know, it, it just is. And, um, uh, the AQC is doing that. They've also added the temperature checks. That's going to be daily. So you might spike a fever on day two. Guess what? You're out. Right. And so, um, those are some of the measures that were taken in countries like South Korea where they were temperature checking people, food delivery people, right? Had to get temperature checks before they could do that. And they knew exactly which delivery person delivered which food to which person so that if one person got sick, they could immediately trace it back to that delivery person and then go out and test each of the person that that person had delivered to. Like that's the kind of of tight networking and contact tracing they were doing in that country. And the success of it is indisputable, right? So it's good that the AKC is taking measures like this and adding this in. You know, it's not just for show. Like these things matter. You are going to catch cases, right? Okay. Um, so strike one indoors, but we, we, I just talked a little bit about that. Strike two is, um, it's in Florida. And so I think that's something that's really important. I mentioned something earlier called mobility data. And guess what? Everybody lies about how often they travel and who they've <laughs> been around and do they go to their grandparents' house and, they're like, I've been locked up in my house, except for the time I went to the restaurant and the bar for Mary's birthday, and we had six people there, but they were also all locked down. So it's all good. Okay, no, 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 no. The cell phone data simply looks at the amount of distance that your phones have traveled. And okay? we don't go nowhere without our phones. And everybody <laughs> takes their phones with them. The data is very reliable. It's impervious to lying. Okay. And so what we see is... Uh, here in the United States, unfortunately, something that um, I predicted months and months ago, and when the virus, basically when it, when it started, it hit high density population areas, right? Where there was a lot of air travel connections to China. So we had one case start on the East Coast, one start on the West Coast, and they were trying to figure out who got it first, whatever. Starts with large cities, 
lots of people, close area, and spreads easily. These tend to be politically leaning Democrat, right? Big cities here in the United States, our big cities tend to lean Democrat politically. Our smaller towns, rural, sparsely populated areas tend to lean Republican, okay? And so 60 to 70% of cases were in Democratic controlled places. Now, six months later, what has happened? 70%, it's a complete flip, okay? And it has to do with, unfortunately, in the United States, politics. And people willing to take certain measures, the largest one being masks. And that's the one everyone talks about, right? Mass, 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 mass. We're going to fight about our masks. But what about fighting about travel, right? Mobility, getting around, going to the store, um, uh, not just on vacation. We're talking about just any kind of travel, right? So they're, they're able to check the phones. And what you see in the United States, before this starts, you know, you have some baseline of travel. And then nationwide, a 55% decrease in travel, nationwide. And this is like back in, in March, yeah. March, April. Every state has it. So when you look at all the state data, um, it, it's the same everywhere. 50% in April decrease, right? In Texas, 50%. California, 55%. Florida, 55%. New York, 65%, but they were extra special, right? Because they got hit super hard. So extra special in a bad way, less likely to travel. Um, and so the differences happen six months later, right? When and, and how quickly people started to travel again. So for example, if we look at it in June as a nation, the reduction was only 20%. So uh, lots of people had resumed moving around, going to work, going out to stores. Texas, 20%, which again, that's the national average. This is in June now, June. So they went from 50% decrease. Now they're back up to only a 20% decrease. New York, though, stayed locked down more so, 40%. California, 38%. Florida, kind of in the middle, 30%. Now, what happens to today? Like literally, like you're looking at mobile cell phone data for the last week. Texas, still not back to normal. 12%, nationally, 15%, nationally, 15%. So hang on. New York still at 24%, still traveling less than Texans. California, 27%. Florida, 18%. Hawaii, 35%, right? And Hawaii, for those of you who don't know, has been democratic its entire existence. Democrat, lean, lean blue. South Dakota, Oklahoma, and Montana is on the positive side, which means they are moving around now more than before the pandemic started. We, everybody's we, right. running out. And okay, <laughs> and so stuff. it's no coincidence the cases are spiking in, in those country uh, countries, states, uh, worse than others. So there's some tie-in here to travel and mobility, and that is something we're kind of not talking about in dog agility, right? We're having our Facebook fights and arguments with friends and colleagues over mask wearing, right? To me, that that's uh, that battle is over. Okay, the science is out. Mask wearing works. I'm shocked that it works as well as it did. I'll, t I'll tell you quite frankly, you know, I'm like, man, you know, people are putting some garbage stuff on their face. Like, how's this going to really work? And yet the data shows that it has. Now, whether it's from the actual mask themselves or when you see a person with a mask, you tend to stay away from them. I don't know, right? They need better studies. But we know that it has had a tremendous impact, not just in this country, but in other countries, right? And so do we want to be traveling around and in these states that have these kinds of numbers. And so Florida is not the worst state, but it's certainly not doing well. And you're having the event there. The US Open, as Jen pointed out, was canceled. It was supposed to be held there in Florida. And so now the AKC is having this indoor trial in the state of Florida. Florida. And I assure you that by the time December rolls around, we are going to be back on track for over a thousand deaths a day. Okay, just science. People are like, if you want to ask me, well, how do you know? I know the same way I knew on the day we did this podcast and got out paper and pen and graph paper. And on that day, we had 319 cases and 15 dead. And we accurately predicted how many people would be infected and die in a month, in two months, and three months, right? So we have, and we have much more data now than we did then, right? So look, things are going to get worse. I think there's an outside chance the invitational gets canceled. Okay. I'm just going to put that out there. So just like we had talked about before in our last podcast, 
related to this, uh, not not in March, the the follow up one that we did, like mass returning wearing, to trials, on mass wearing, mass returning wearing, on trials, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. You need to look at your own individual risk factors on whether or not you're going to go to this event. I know that there are people listening to this that are still debating, deciding. Okay, and uh, yes, AKC is doing everything possible, but it is no guarantee of your safety. Certainly, some people are more risk averse than others. If you are young and you are healthy, your chance of getting uh, sick is slim. Your chance of dying is even slimmer. Okay. Even if you are not that well and you are old and you have COPD and you smoked and you got all these problems, your chance of getting infected are also still relatively small. Okay. And your chance of dying is also relatively small. Okay. But it is what we call non-zero. Okay. And we know that over these past several months, people in the Agilent community have gotten coronavirus and died. Okay. So if there's anyone who's listening who didn't know that, okay, multiple people have gotten the virus, multiple people have died. Okay. And, and the ones that we're not hearing about are the people who got sick from agility people, right? And died. But since they are themselves not in dog sports or agility, no one knows about. Okay. And that is the real insidious danger of the coronavirus. Okay. Having said all of that now, Invitational, they're doing everything that they can. They have a COVID-19 declaration form. They're probably going to ask you, you know, where you've traveled. Uh, have you been around sick people and things like that? Uh, obviously, be honest. <laughs> if you are sick, I understand you've worked hard. It's very hard to get in this competition, et cetera, et cetera. Top five of each breed. Probably spent a lot of money trialing to get there. Stay home, okay? Uh, I certainly don't believe that it's worth uh, someone else's life for you to uh, be able to compete at this event, Okay. So I, we're just going to put that out there. Okay. I guess related to that, we should say that for people who are going, and actually the majority of people who sign up for this course don't go to the Invitational. They're just using it for general dog training, preparing for local trials. We do have the AKC Invitational Prep course, which is out, just started. Yes, can people just started. Use- no, but they cannot <laughs> not register. It is closed now. But for the people who registered, um, we are going through exercises. And one of the things that um, we do want people doing is practicing with their mask on. Yes. So, yeah. Okay. That, that is exactly why I mentioned that. I did not realize that it was closed. Um, but that makes sense now that it already started. I started seeing <laughs> the videos coming in. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. Okay. So, should you be practicing with the mask? Yeah, I think yes. You should definitely do it. We're all doing it. Um, you know, I've been doing it because I've been wearing masks at AKC Nationals, you know, for the dirt the past several years. So yeah, I made sure it gets you had exposure to that. Jennifer, have you been running with masks? I, I know the answer because I've seen <laughs> I've seen it on the internet, like your photos and things. But what what are you doing as far as like mass specific training with dogs? So in at my facility, if I am in the facility with anybody else, I'm wearing a mask. Um, not necessarily because I'm practicing for the dogs. Um, I feel like I did that back in March and April and they're pretty comfortable. Um, the only time I will run without a mask is if I'm there by myself and training on my own. Um, I haven't been doing a lot of trials, but maybe what you've seen is I've been doing some confirmation and, uh, <laughs> all the ones that I've gone to have been masks, um, 100% of the time. So my dogs are definitely getting used to it being in the ring, being around people. I mean, in confirmation, it's even crazier because they come up to you on a table and they're doing an exam on the dog. So they're looking at, you know, another person, a stranger in a mask going over the dog. And I did have one dog that was a little uh, unsure of the person approaching them in a mask. Um, so we actually have been doing a little bit of practicing on that. But yep, I would say at this point, you know, we're talking March to now October, I've been doing a lot of mask running and the dogs are getting re- very well adjusted to it and very used to it. Yeah, I think a lot of the adjustment uh, is more so on the human's part. Yeah. Right. Just the discomfort of it. Uh, one thing I'll point out in, in with the mass, I think, uh, it's happened to everyone that I talk with about it. They feel like they can't catch their breath and they want to rip the mask off. But when you think about it, let, let me have you like run for hard for 30 seconds without a mask and you'll also feel the same way. <laughs> you're, you're like chest hurts and then you can't get enough air and you're just sucking in all the air, you know? And so there's, to me, there's very little difference. You know, there's a the huge psychological component, obviously, but unless you have an actual medical physiological issue uh, where you can't oxygenate properly, um, then you're going to be fine, right? Uh, exercising, running around with a mask. Okay. The last thing we're going to talk about is Westminster. So yeah, Sarah, the, you got the information. This on is Westminster. what uh, kind of, um, uh, 
kicked it all off where we thought, well, let's use this opportunity to give an update. And, and there's that a is, beautiful video you guys need to watch. Yeah, it's pretty cool, like drone footage. So Westminster announced uh, today as of, uh, of taping, uh, we're taping on um, October 21st, and they just announced that they are um, postponing, well, not postponing, they're moving the date of Westminster to June. So normally it's February every mm -hmm. year in New York, inside in a very small space and it is sold packed out every with year like, packed yeah, with people thousand um, plus right and in the middle of like you know new york um new york new york <laughs> and uh they are moving it to june so that so you know much further into the year um as you said there is potential that we have vaccines before june which would be amazing but it is going to be at a um some sort of huge property it looks like a castle. I'm not from New York, so I'm not familiar with this place, but it's called Lindhurst. Um, a property of the National Trust for Historic Preservation in Terrytown, New York. Yes. Did I say that correctly? Yep. Uh, and so the Masters Agility Championship will be on Friday, June 11th. Um, and then they will have the Masters uh, Obedience Championship on the 12th and uh, Best in Show will be on June 12th and 13th. So moving the whole event to a place where they can um, have social distance, they still don't know what all precautions they will need to take, but this gives them a lot of flexibility, both in timing and in location. Mm -hmm. So um, for those of you who have entered in the past, this is about the time of year, like October, November, where the premium comes out. That is not coming out. They'll, they will wait a few more months, get a little bit more data. They just announced the change in the venue and the date, and uh, we can look for that premium sometime early next year. So, Jen, you and I have run this event. We have both run in the finals, been on TV, et cetera, et cetera, with all the people. I think it's sad to be losing the crowd, very sad to lose the crowd. But um, I'm very hopeful for this event. What are your thoughts? Well, my first thought is this this means a huge change for the run itself because we're now outdoors on grass. That is a huge factor and a huge consideration. Um, I know for me personally, you know, Pink Pink's relatively young. We don't have outside agility uh, in Ohio. She doesn't have much experience running outside. Um, so I'm a little bit concerned about thinking ahead to what that's mm. going to mean for my dogs. And am I going to see more, more knocked bars? You yeah, know, am I going to exactly. need to go train outside? Uh, what happens if it rains? What happens if the grass is wet? So my immediate brain goes to, oh my gosh, outdoor agility. Uh, yeah. which those of you in Texas probably are not even batting an eye at or Florida or California. But for me, I'm like, oh my God, outdoor agility. Um, we don't get our nice level turf that we're used to. Although I'm sure they'll have very groomed, uh, grounds. Um, uh -huh. you know, so who knows what they'll do with tenting and crating and what if the bad weather, but I definitely right. like to push back to June, uh, gives more time, um, for us to kind of figure out where things are tracking and how things are going, um, you know, and definitely better chance of, of good weather. We couldn't be outdoors in February. <laughs> uh, right, certainly. Right. So, yeah. uh, no, I think it'll be, it'll be exciting. I mean, I think every time you have a new event, right. Think of the premier cup and how exciting that was. Cause it was a new event or the very sure, first couple sure. years of Westminster, we were all excited. I mean, already, People that have been, oh, Westminster, it's just another show, are already sharing the posts on Facebook. Going, Ooh, did you guys see this? You know, it's at this estate. And um, so I think it'll be certainly interesting and exciting to see how things go. Um, we'll, we have time to see what they're going to do from a precaution standpoint and how they're going to handle things with, spe like you said, spectators. And uh, are they going to increase the entry? Are they going to decrease mm -hmm. the entry? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. something, oh, well, you're outside. You know, you could have a third ring or because, see, that was one of the big limitations with That's tiers. Right. You could only do two rings. Right. So um, will you do a third ring? Are you going to have, you know, the meet the breeds? Or are you going to keep it the two right. rings or maybe even make it less runs and less people? So there's a lot of um, questions that are kind of exciting sure, to sure. see what they will announce. But I, I, all in all, I think it was absolutely a good decision at this point to go ahead and push back. But that does give me even more time, my my timeline for the fall as we've kind of recapped these events was uh, U.S. Open early November, and that got canceled. Tryouts late November, that got uh, postponed. I, I usually go to the Invitational, mm -hmm. but don't compete, and so therefore I'm not going this year. Mm -hmm. uh, February is Westminster. So for me right now in October, the first event that I was looking at, you know, being hopeful would come back 
um, is Westminster. And then we get word today that it's pushed back. So now I'm looking at late March, hopefully AKC Nationals. Um, we'll have some announcements coming out soon, uh, you know, uh, what they're going to do. But uh, yeah, certainly uh, kind of trailing our coronavirus into 2021. I think everybody thought, you know, oh, I can't wait for 2020 to be over. But the reality of it is January 1st, we're not going to wake up and see some, you know, drastically different world. So uh, I like people looking ahead. And I think as an exhibitor, the more notice I have about something, the happier I am. So I can kind of plan out my training. So I'm very happy with Westminster's decision. Yeah, I like how they basically went the route of a UKI here and said, we're going to push this event off. They pushed it very, very far off, like into the summer, giving giving us time. Um, I think there's a little bit of carrot and stick here too, right? They're like, we're delaying the event, but look at this place that we're going to have it at. And all of it, you know, and everybody's all excited. It worked. They got me with the video. Like you guys need to see this video. Sarah put a link to it and it's gorgeous. I'm like, Oh, castle. I know. I want to be a part of that. But there's also some feeling of the loss of, uh, of our national events and AKC, USDA, all this stuff. And so maybe people who had not previously considered that they want to go there, uh, might think about it this time, you know? And so I think that would be great. So again, just a reminder, Westminster, the, for the finals, they like breed diversity, right? So your chances are a little bit better if you have these uh, other breeds, non-traditional breeds, I'll, I'll call it that. And so, you know, I want to encourage you guys to uh, really consider it. Uh, and I think that you're going to be in a, a state where people are handling the pandemic, I think probably a little bit better, a little more seriously. Uh, Westminster obviously being very serious about it, but outdoors, right? Everybody going to have masks and all, and all of that. And even, even here, they acknowledge a couple of things. They say, you know, due to the ever changing government restrictions during the pandemic, a move to a springtime outdoor dog show was necessary to uphold Westminster's strong commitment to the health and safety of everyone who attends our show. And so, you know, to me, it sounds like they are very much committed to uh, safety there. So it'll be very interesting to uh, see how that shakes out. All right. I think we've covered all the ground that I had hoped that we were going to cover. And I think we did it uh, fairly in depth. If you guys have any questions, uh, definitely follow up, send us an email at uh, what's the email that we use for everybody. Team team T E A M at bad dog agility.com. Feel free to ask all your questions. Uh, you know, obviously we've been getting tons of questions over the past several months. I'm, I'm happy to answer everything as best I can or refer you to someone who can help you with your questions. Um, the thought that I want to close on is, um, I, I think at this point, we all kind of have a strong sense of what is helpful in the pandemic and what is not as helpful. Um, I want to start preparing everyone, as Jen pointed out, you know, everybody thought, hey, you know, let's just get through the summer. We're going to be okay. No, it's going to go a little longer than that. But I want to prepare everyone that the vaccines may not be the end all be all, at least not right away. Okay, there are going to be a lot of issues around the vaccines. I expect issues to extend throughout 2021 and into 2022. Okay, I hope that that is not the case. I think there's a chance that it won't be the case. All right, but I would prepare yourself mentally for that. Uh, The other thing is that masks, use them. And in my opinion, in dog agility, they should be mandatory for everyone at an agility trial, including the person running the dog. Um, And... For people who are very uh, uh, concerned about safety and well-being of others, and you know they're always going to wear a mask, I think that they're that people like that, uh, which includes me. So people like me might get very focused on people who refuse to wear masks for a variety of reasons. People who refuse to wear masks, uh, but a lot of it is political, and. Um, these uh, dissenters, if we, if you want to call them dissenters, can can really be the focus of, you know, your behavior. Like you're going to actively work to not be around them or not go to trials where they're at and things like that. But remember that the majority of people who are transmitting the virus are asymptomatic, right? And so you have less to fear from someone that you're going to come in contact with for a very brief amount of time. And they're probably going to be forced to have masks wherever you're meeting them in a grocery store, at a doctor's office, uh, certainly, and at an agility trial where masks are largely required, mandatory. It is your family member when you're going to be at a a gathering that, you you know, you don't live with, uh, especially now we're talking about the holidays is what is what I'm leading into here. Thanksgiving and all these things, you're going to get people together. Someone's going to have it. You're not going to know. You're going to be around them for a day or two or three, and then it's going to spread. There are going to be problems. Okay. 
So I understand your frustration with the people who refuse to wear masks. Look to your own networks, your own social networks. Make sure that you are protecting yourselves. Make sure that you are making good decisions. Make sure you're thinking about it a lot during this holiday season. The data, which is going to be cases and deaths over the next several weeks, I think are going to inform a lot of your decision making with respect to uh, Thanksgiving, Christmas plans. Those are really big holidays here in the United States. Lots of traditionally, lots of travel, lots of social interaction, lots of indoor stuff as the weather gets cold and drives people together. So, you know, that's just a, that's just a, a fire throwing gasoline on a fire. So just everybody keep that in mind. Let's uh, stay focused. There's a lot of things we need to do about the virus. It's not just all about the mess. All right. Well, that's it for this week's podcast. We'd like to thank our sponsor, hitaboard.com. Happy training. <laughs>